Alrighty, so let's look through the basic, like the perfect three turn, right? This is kind of what we're looking for, so we want Dimension Hall on our first turn. And then we want to kill her between the second and third turns by attacking her, because I mean, we're not going to OTK her on the second turn. So, again, look at the hand, have a look at what you got. Dragon is very good, because a dragon, again, the starter deck comes with a lesser dragon. Dragon can fuse into Blackland Fire Dragon if you fuse it with the Spellcaster, which is 2k attack on the mountain, which is good. You can also fuse into Gamori Dragon if you fuse it with a Fiend, which is also 2000 attack on the mountain. And then any dragon, I believe as long as it's 1200 or higher, so any of those three dragons I just mentioned, the ones you actually can play, uh, fuse into Stone D with any rock, which that's 2k as well. So if we have Dimensional Dragon, we basically want to get rid of anything that's not useful and then just play these. So get rid of everything else, redundant copies of Dimensional, anything like that. And then we put the Dimensional in the middle. I talk about this a lot, so I don't want to spend way too much time on this, but this is another AI that if you have a card face down in the middle of the field, she is not going to play in front of her. So she plays a monster to the right, or a trap card to the right. Now she moves this forward, it is not a trap card. If she plays to the right and defends with it, that's a trap card, and I will probably talk more about that later, but just in case I don't, um, the traps she has is Shadow of Eyes, Mesmeric Control, Invisible Wire, and Acid Trap Hole. So if she plays a trap, there is a 1 in 4 chance that it is not something that actually stops you from attacking her. Now if she plays something to the right and moves it forward, it is a monster, and because she has so many equips, she has like 11 equips in her deck, if you don't see her using equip, it's actually incredibly likely that this is either a Darkfire Dragon or Kanan the Sword Mistress. Um, she still can equip Kanan the Sword Mistress, but if she doesn't equip this and she moves it forward, it's probably Darkfire Dragon. Not guaranteed, but it is probably Darkfire Dragon because she doesn't actually have any equips that can go on Darkfire Dragon, funny enough. So, yeah. Doesn't really matter if you have a hand this good, but it's just important knowledge so that you kind of know what's going on with uh, my. So after this, you know, she's played monster. Um, to the right, moved it forward, we activate the Dimensional as you would expect. Really don't need to over explain this, we're just using Dimensional to close the gap. You've seen it ad nauseum, then we attack her directly. Now, here, I have Skullbird, so I'm absolutely going to use Skullbird. If we roll back the tape a little bit, again, look in your hand for what's actually good here. So what I could do here is, I could attack her with Lesser Dragon plus Megamorph, that will be 2k, and then when she moves out the way, I can move my Lesser Dragon two spaces, or one space even, and then I can fuse a Karibo over it, which would make a... Now, any Fiend works, not just Karibo. Um, I just put Karibo on the deck, so I had more Fiends. Make a Komori Dragon, which is 2k on Mountain, and attack her again. However, I have a Skullbird here, which is kind of what I wanted to demonstrate. So we attack her with a Skullbird. Now, Skullbird, Dimension Hole, Skullbird, Lesser Dragon is like the Wombo combo. If you have not edited your deck at this point into the run, like the speed run, or you're playing No Password, having these cards here is insane. And again, you've noticed that we didn't use any summoning power in our first turn, so we have seven now. So we can play Skullbird now, which drops our SP down to one, and then we regenerate three, so that on our third turn, we can still play Lesser Dragon. So here I attack with a Skullbird. Now if you didn't have Lesser Dragon, you could still move your Skullbird two spaces, and then fuse something over it to attack for lethal. Now in this situation, what I've actually done is moved away. If she plays something quite high attack, like she fuses, puts equips on it, or whatever, it may be in your interest to not move your deck leader away. That way, what she would do is attack you directly with the card she just played, instead of destroying your Skullbird. Again, earlier I mentioned that she didn't equip her card, so it's probably Darkfire Dragon, and because she can't actually play anything that would kill Skullbird on a first turn without equipping it, that card she just played is not going to kill Skullbird. So I don't have to worry about Skullbird dying here, and especially also so because I have the Lesser Dragon that I plan to attack her with. Now if she plays to her left and defends, that is a trap card. Or it's it, it could possibly be a ritual, but it's very likely to be a trap card, and again if it's a trap card, 3 and 4 chance, like it's a 75% chance that that stops you from attacking. 
but she didn't play a trap card, she played top right. And even if she did play a trap card there, well, you can just attack here anyway. Um, there's nothing adjacent to her deck leader. So you can see she's got 1600 life points, so we just attack her with a lesser dragon. And that's it. That's it. That's really it. So as long as you deal 4k attack across your second and third turn after you play Dimension Hall, you can get a 3 turn on her. Anytime she doesn't play a trap card to her left, or on the first turn if she plays a trap card to her right, that can also screw you up. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, trap stuff later. If she did play a trap here on the first turn, it is up to you if you want to take the risk and attack through it. Again, there's a 25% chance it actually doesn't stop you attacking if it's a Shadow of Eyes. Um, you do have to assess risk, and I'm not going to say that this duel is really perfect or anything. There's things that can screw up even if you draw really good hands, which is why it makes a duel like this a lot more difficult than something like Tristan. Um, you know, ignoring the fact that it's just a lot harder to draw into damage and stuff like that. Now, here's a bit of a scuffed recording. It's still a D-hole 3 turn, but basically... Again, normally your zombies are weakened by 500, so you're very unlikely to lethal like this. But what I'm basically trying to demonstrate here is that as long as you have the damage to kill her, this is how you should go about it. If you don't have anything strong on Mountain, your next best option is just trying to do lethal damage across two hits. So, you know, stack as many equips as you can on your most powerful monster, and also keep in mind what you can play on your next turn. I still have three summoning power. I'm going to regenerate three to six, so I can play anything else here to lethal. Now again, I also mentioned uh, in the previous thing that if you leave your deck leader there, then she will attack you directly, unless it's like Kanan, which can't move two spaces here. Again, she has nothing next to her, so all I need to do is 1600 attack here, and you can see here I draw the Lesser Dragon, also do the Slate Warrior, which again, Slate Warrior here. I could play the Slate Warrior, do 2400, which means that my first attack only needed to be 1600 in that instance. So this is kind of why you just want to play as much damage as possible, and then get rid of cards that aren't going to lead to you doing more damage. This is also partly with knowing your deck, and getting rid of cards that aren't actually going to uh, help you kill her on the third turn. Um, you can see I basically got rid of everything. I even got rid of the Yami, because even though Yami seems like a very powerful card and there's strategies to win with it, a Yami wouldn't actually let me win on the third turn, so I got rid of it, hoping to draw more damage, and I drew the Lesser Dragon, and I could kill her here. Now, I want to go through a duel that actually wasn't a three turn. It's something that is probably should be a three turn, but the reality is in a speedrun, it's not always going to be perfect. So here I've got Dimensional, I played it. I don't know exactly what I moved out of the way, but here what I'm doing is getting rid of everything that's not going to make me kill her on the third turn, and then attacking her with the Skullbird. Now, the goal of this was to demonstrate that I can do this play, and then on the third turn, I can move my Skullbird, and hopefully fuse something on top of that to attack her for lethal, which I don't draw into, but I will talk about that in a second, when we actually get to the third turn and I make my move. Now, probably why I moved my deck leader is that first card was not something that was going to kill a Skullbird. Like, if she doesn't equip it, she's not going to kill a Skullbird unless she fuses or equips. She cannot kill 2400 on her first turn without fusing or equipping. She just can't play anything that powerful. So here what I do, I move a Skullbird here. Now, you could just move it to the right once if you want to draw a Warrior and fuse a Punished Eagle, but another thing, another fusion you can make with a Winged Beast is Garvis, which can't move through spaces on the mountain. So I move my Skullbird here, right? That way, at this point, I can move my deck leader forward, and now I can play a card over my Skullbird to hopefully fuse to create another monster and attack her directly. Uh, because once you fuse a monster on the field, you can actually move it again. So, because our Skullbird can't kill her, uh, it can only move two spaces, we can move it closer to a deck leader so that if we fuse something over it, we can then kill her. So here what I'll be looking for is a Warrior. I can fuse a Warrior over any Winged Beast that has 1300 attack or higher to make Punished Eagle. And this deck comes with, again, I couldn't play Zanki if I drew it here, that's always very clunky and awkward. Uh, but I couldn't play that here, but I could play my Skullstalker or my Kagemusha the Blue Flame over this Skullbird, create Punished Eagle, and attack her for 2600, which is lethal here. The other option I have, this starter deck comes with Obese Marmor of Nefariousness and also Lizark. And if I fuse a Beast over a Winged Beast and make Garvis, I would attack her directly for 2k here. So that would be the three-turn demonstration of the, you know, Skullbird into Punished Eagle or Skullbird into Garvis. Very, very important. Very important to know that, but that does not happen. I draw a hand here and I fuck all. I really have nothing 
um, which is going to happen sometimes. So um, what I choose to do here is I block the space in front of her. So normally if I left this skull bird here and didn't play to my right, what she would actually do is move two spaces forward. Um, that way she's out of the attacking range of the skull bird. Um, that's something you can do, and then you can try to play behind you and attack her directly. But what I opt to do here is play to the right and just block her summoning space by getting rid of these cards. And then so now what she's going to do is move to the corner, try to move as far away from my skull bird as possible. Because she can't move out of its attacking range, so just moves to the corner. And then because she has no available um, places to play anything apart from the right side, she will play to the right side. Uh, despite any biases, this is the last available um, summoning space. It's the only available summoning space, so she plays a card here basically regardless um, of anything else. Now, the reason I do this is that it opens the door without it potentially attacking a monster. Now I can move to the right and then just play a card over this and attack it with anything. Now, realistically, I wouldn't have two Skull Birds. Um, so you just attack her with anything that's 1600 here. If you're not entirely sure what she's playing because she's in the corner, you can attack over both of her face downs and then there's nothing... Like, either there you will trigger a trap which means you can attack directly, or you won't trigger a trap, and then you guaranteed, like, you're safe, you don't need to worry about it. Um, but another thing you could actually do here is just, I could play a zombie onto the wasteland and attack her directly, and then if that triggers a trap, then my uh, my skull bird could kill her. So that's probably what you would do in a real speedrun. Um, but yeah. You know, just play the armored zombie, because that is you can attack. And again, you can also play... Um, Kagemush with the blue flame in this situation um, under Punished Eagle, like I wanted to demonstrate last turn. Again, um, here I'm just basically highlighting the options. Like if I didn't have anything lethal on the wasteland, I still have this Skull Bird to work with. I've moved over that card, I can fuse over it to play, uh, make a Punished Eagle, or for example a Garbus and kill her here anyway. So at this point, those are options pretty much. Uh, let's talk about strategies that don't involve Dimension Hole in particular. So this is the dragon strategy. You only have one dragon in your starter deck, but if you open with it and you don't open with anything else, you should be playing this because it's really hard to come by, you know, like in this duel, there's so little cards that are very good to open with that if you open with a dragon and nothing else, you basically just have to play this. So we play the lesser dragon, top right. And what I'm doing is getting rid of anything that's not going to actually contribute to the rest of the duel, which I'll go into a little bit later. And then you launch it. So what she does here is actually she'll play to the right if she has a monster, or a trap. If she has a trap, she'll play to the right. If she doesn't have either of these things to play, like if she doesn't have SP to play a monster, she will play top left and block you, which I will go through um, in the next few segments. But what you're looking for is to play... Uh, put this lesser dragon to her left side, and then this will result in her moving forward. If you were to play the lesser dragon on her right side, then she would just move two spaces to the left. Now again, she has bonus movement, so what she actually does here is move two spaces forward, and then she's basically in the middle of the field, and we can just attack her on the uh, third turn, which is crazy, right? Now, because she opened, it seems like with a trap, she can play a monster this turn. So she plays a monster there and then destroys our lesser dragon. Which we can use the lesser dragon to follow up and do things with that, which I should have in the upcoming footage. But basically, that card is effectively out of play now. So now we have options here. She's right in front of us, so we can play basically the highest attack card we possibly can. And it's going to play a 2100 attack. And then attack her directly. Just take as much damage as we can as early as possible. And then anything that's not going to contribute to high damage on the next turn, we get rid of. Now, in this situation, she will move two spaces left. However, we if we move our monster over the deck leader, she will stay on the same spot. Or rather, yeah, if we move the deck leader over the monster, then there's nothing threatening her and she will just stay on this spot. So there are your two options. 
here I'm going to do this. She'll move two space to the left, play out of the way, and then I can attack her again directly. She'll play out of the way. Again, Empress Judge is way too far away to have any impact on the duel anymore. And then now we just, yeah, play in front of her, and then whatever is lethal, we kill her with. Now, depending on if you have passwords or not, you may or may not have Dark Energy. You need to enter a password for that. Now, you don't have Haniwa, but if I have the any of the rocks that the deck comes with, I can still make Stone D with it. So the Haniwa here is just a rock component. So here for lethal, I could put a Megamorph or... Like, Dark Energy can't go on less Dragon. But what you could do here is say, anything that's 1900 is good. So I could, you know, maybe play... Um, I could fuse a Great Mammoth with an Equip, right? Or I can play... Kamori Dragon, I can play Blackland Fire Dragon, or in this case, I have Stone D, which is just Lesser Dragon plus a Rock. And again, if I didn't have Haniwa, if I had, uh, the starter deck comes with Stone Ghost and Statue of Easter Island, so if you imagine a Rock is either of those cards, I can play it this turn, I can absolutely lethal with it. So if we want to get lethal here, we just need to play anything that's 1900 or higher. And again, that value obviously depends on what you opened with, but we played as much damage as we possibly could, to attack her on that third turn, which means we just needed to make up the difference on the second attack. Now, I will mention that if she plays to the top left, what we actually have to do, because uh, it, her top left is basically the tile in front of this lesser dragon, and that stops us from moving it two spaces forward on our second turn, what we actually have to do instead to back this up is actually move our lesser dragon two spaces to the left which i will go through why we do that now this is not the same duel but i'll basically show you where you want to position your cards which is why i mentioned putting lesser dragon two spaces to the left so we've opened with the card in the middle and what she's going to do here is play to the top left and this is because she doesn't have any monsters she can play or any traps she can play so she plays to the top left and Quick little tip, if you don't already know this, if the AI plays a card that isn't a monster and they leave it in attack mode, if they have Curse Breaker, that's a Curse Breaker. That's what that card is. Now, it's not super important if that's a Curse Breaker or Monster Reborn or anything like that. You really don't have control over it. But the AI always leave Curse Breakers in attack mode. Um, it really telegraphs if something's a Curse Breaker or not. Anyway, the point of this is she's played top left, and if she did this, after you had moved your Lesser Dragon on that spot in front of it, you would have to back this up. So the position you want your cards to have is, you want to play top left here, any monster is good for this demonstration what I'm trying to do. So we have a card here. Now that tile is where the tile I just put Dimension Hole on. This is where your Lesser Dragon should be if she blocks your lesser dragon from moving forward and then basically what this does is force her to play to the left so if we have two cards positioned like this um you can see two cards positioned so that they're like this compared to a deck leader so one of them is two spaces forward and one to the right of her deck leader and then also there's a card behind it you don't actually need the card behind it and she's not actually 100% guaranteed to play to the right. If she plays like a really high attack card, she'll play to the right and attack you because she thinks you can beat your card. But our cards face down, enemy have values that they assume your face down cards is, which doesn't affect their deck leader movement. For example, they move, won't move away from a spell, but it does make a difference in when they assess if they're a monster of theirs can beat one of yours. So if she thinks your face down is 1500 attack or whatever, basically assumes it's a monster because of that to my understanding that is true and when you have monsters positioned like this again the positioning of the cards here is what really matters specifically uh it's based on not the field but the distance and position from her deck leader she plays to the left so she played a monster to the left which is basically out of play now she's going to move it to the left and then what she's played is effectively out of the way now next turn i can move forward and I can play a card and attack her directly. Now, if I... You can see I've got the dimension hole there. And here is basically where I'm demonstrating the position of the cards here. So, you can see the two cards that I have in the position that... Uh, in the distance and the tiles they are from her deck leader is what's important. 
At this point, I can activate the Dimension Hall. Now, the other thing is, if that was a lesser dragon, I can move that one space to the right, and then move my deck leader forward, and then fuse something over it, a Spellcaster or a Fiend, and then I can attack her with 2k. Another option is I can move forward and just, if I can possibly play a Skullbird, I can move forward, play a Skullbird, flip it up and attack her directly, because that also has a movement boost. Um, but that is how you back that up. If you watch the rest of this, we Dimension all forward, which is not actually, we don't have to do that. I have Skullbird in the hand. So I can just move forward and attack with the Skullbird. But what this actually does is gives us a backup. So I would do this in a speed run because we're a step closer. Now she will move two spaces to the right because she can't move two spaces to the left because she put a monster there and moved it. So you notice she moves to the right instead. It does, you may think that it's random when they move, but it's not. She will always bias towards moving to the left, but because she can't move two spades to the left, she can only move one to the left, it would still be in attacking range of the Skullbird, so she decides to move two spades to the right, where she's actually now out of the attacking range of the monster threatening her. Now she plays to the right, it could be a trap card, but you can see she's equipped this, it's a power increase, so that's the monster, so we don't have to worry about that being a trap card. So, as long as next turn we could possibly attack her with 1600, we will kill her. There's nothing she can do about that now at this point. So we move the Skullbird, I've talked about this before, but you can also check the hand here. Here I have Lesser Dragon, which I can just play top left and attack her directly. We know that that card next to her is not a trap card, she's equipped it, so that's a monster. So we just play the Lesser Dragon here and kill her. The other option is, again, I can move that Skullbird. If I don't have a Lesser Dragon, or I don't have 1600 in the hand. For example, if I have a Mammoth Graveyard and a Zombie, I can move my deck leader to the left and play a card top left and attack her directly with 1600 or like move left play top left a uh, um uh slate warrior and then attack her for lethal but here i have the dragon so i could just play that and attack her otherwise if you don't have something that can kill her like that but you have like a warrior or a beast as i mentioned the skullbird can kill her by moving the skullbird closer to her deck leader so it's right next to her and then we move forward and then i would play you know, either a warrior or a beast over it, as I talked about before the fusions, that would be lethal. The Punished Eagle or the Garvis, respectively, would both be lethal here. And also, like, for example, if I didn't have 2400 damage, if I needed to make 2000 damage here, like if I'd already attacked her with a fused Lesser Dragon, like into a Kimura Dragon or something, and I was in the same position, I could move that next to her deck leader, um, to, you know, the tile to the left of her deck leader, move my deck leader forward, and then fuse a rock over that and kill her. But here we just kill her with a lesser dragon. And she's dead. When she, you know, cooked us a little bit. Alright, so now, if we're in a position where we've just attacked her with Black Land Fire Dragon, now, one option I have is to move my Black Land Fire Dragon to the left and play something over that and attack her. But... You know, because we don't have two dragons, um, I don't have the summoning power here to play Skullbird or whatever. We're going to have to take a, you know, uh, we're going to lose a turn here. So, let's go ahead and play from this point. We've just attacked her directly once. And if we were to actually move the Blackland Fire Dragon to the left of her deck leader, then she would move forward two spaces or possibly move onto the Wasteland. Uh, but this is basically a safe option, so... If I could move my Blackland Fire Dragon, what I could do is move it to the left over that card. If I could move my deck leader forward and then play something over that, like, you know, another dragon that's lethal or a Skullbird that's lethal, I could do that. But I can't really do any of these things. So what I actually am going to do here is get rid of as many cards as I can and hope to draw a rock card. Now, I mentioned before that the only two rocks we have in the starter deck is a uh, statue of easter island and stone ghost so in this situation i actually wouldn't ditch that dragon there the four star card because i would need to reserve four stars to play a rock but the point of this demonstration is again fusing and attacking her i can't really say that everything is realistic in this i do i <laughs> i like i get if it's confusing but my point is i'm trying to draw a rock because this is something that's going to fuse with a black land fire dragon to kill her. So that's why I ditch everything there. And I can play the Haniwa and I can kill her. Now, if 
you just imagine that I didn't ditch the lesser dragon, then I would still have four summoning power and I could play one of the rocks that's in the starter deck. But effectively what I'm showing you is a move of being able to move the dragon onto this tile and then fusing over a um, stone ghost or a statue of the Easter Island, which you would need four summoning power for. So if you have four summoning power, you can only ditch up to three, which if I ditched every single card except my four star, I would actually have drawn into this rock, and assuming that's rock something in the starter deck, I would kill her here. Oh, it seems a bit scuffed. I hope it makes sense. I probably made it a lot more confusing by talking about this, um, if I'm being honest, but... Basically, what I'm saying is pass, and then you can move the dragon next to her deck leader, and then fuse a rock over it to kill her, because you have two rocks in the deck. Now, another thing we can do is we can move the dragon onto that card that she plays top left, because if she plays top left and she's not going to attack you, well, this is obviously not a monster, so we just attack over it. And what this is, is now we are basically threatening an attack on her, and the only safe space she has to move where she's not being threatened by an attack by the Blackland Fire Dragon is the corner where she's on Wasteland. So we move our dragon there, and this actually forces her to move into the Wasteland corner, and now we can move our deck leader to the left. And so yeah, she's gonna move into the corner, because any other move she makes, she'll still be threatened by our dragon. And then she's very likely to actually play a monster here, in which case she will attack our Blackland Fire Dragon, but that's fine, it's actually, we'd rather do that than her play like a trap card or play something that stops us from killing her next turn, so she's gonna kill our dragon, but it's fine. This is an option you can have, and I would recommend doing this if you already know that you have something that's 2k attack or whatever is lethal, gonna be lethal on Wasteland, that can also move two tiles on Wasteland. So now I move to the left and play top left because the door's wide open, and then I can attack her with, again, Armored Zombie here, or if you had a zombie and a dragon, you could make a zombie dragon attack her, you can also equip a zombie, whatever you have here, that's strong on Wasteland, so it moves two tiles and kills her here, whatever attack she has left. Like, if you're only able to attack her with lesser dragon, you will need 2300, but the point is, you force her into the corner by moving that dragon onto that face down she played top left, and then that will force her to move into the corner, because it's the only safe space she can be. And she plays monster, retaliates, and then you have a, a completely open shot on her, and you just attack her directly and win. That's it. Alright, so this clip, I have a late dimension hole. Again, it's not the optimal strategy, but sometimes you're just not going to open up with a dimension hole, but then you're going to draw into it in the turn after, and it can actually be useful. So here, what I actually kind of want to do is open with a dragon zombie, because I'm kind of hoping that I would draw into a terrain card and then make the play from there, which again, I still have to demonstrate that. So I'm going to play my Dragon Zombie, and no matter what you do, you always want to have a card in this middle tile. I talked about this already ad nauseum, just so that she plays a monster that's out of the way and not in front of her, because that would just ruin your day. So we do that. She plays to the right, because we have a card in the middle. And then on our second turn, we're actually going to draw the Dimension all suddenly, which... Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? So here you can tell I'm actually checking for my Yami, that's where we play it, we'll demonstrate that soon, but I don't have anything useful, but I still have a Skull Bird in the hand, and I have a Dimension Hole. So, what I'm actually going to do is move my Dragon Zombie to the left, and then play a Dimension Hole in front of me. Now the reason why I actually move Dimension Hole there, I intentionally move it two spaces in front of her monster, so that she's going to flip up and attack that card, because once she does that, it's out of play effectively, like it's just too far away from any of us or what we're going to be doing on the follow-up turns for it to even have an impact on the duel. So effectively just using a monster to bait her monster away uh, from the play that we're going to make. So again, we're in the same situation where we have that card in the middle of the field, it's three spaces in front of her deck leader, so she will not play a card in front of her. If you don't have a card in the middle of the field, uh, you know, specifically three spaces in front of her, and she wants to play a trap, she will actually play that trap in front of her, which would ruin you entirely. You wouldn't really be able to do much about that, so. She plays a non-trap, non-monster anyway. And then, of course, here, she goes straight for the attack. And that's a good thing because now this card is just far away, we don't have to worry about it anymore. 
and she can play a trap card, so that's very, very good. So now we can just continue to play with our Dimension Hole. Now it's a turn late, obviously, but this is fine. We can still play, we can still beat her. So now, in this situation, we can attack her with Skullbird here, and as I mentioned before about fusing a Warrior or a Beast over the Skullbird, I basically want to ditch anything here that's not going to like guarantee our win. Uh, another option you would have here is if you had like you want to draw into Slate Warrior. Anything that would deal 1600 attack follow up on the next turn would result in a four turn kill because we're going to do 2400 attack here. I keep a Violet Crystal because if I draw into Dragon Zombie, then that means it will be lethal because it'll be 1100 plus 500 with 1600. So yeah, now she's going to move through space to the left. And again, because on her second turn she played a non-monster, she actually is very likely to have a monster here, because first turn, she'll play a monster that's four stars, or she won't play a monster, right? She has no monsters that are weaker than four stars. So if she opens with a monster, she spent four stars to play that, which means on her second turn she has three, which means she can't possibly play a monster because she has nothing in her deck that is three or less, so she plays a non-monster, that means on her third turn, she has six summoning power, which is enough to play literally any monster in her deck apart from Harpy's Pet Dragon. Uh, so she's extremely likely to play a monster here. Now she chases us with a tie home, but she's just way too far away to do anything. And she moves that card forward, you know it's not a trap card. Even if it was, theoretically, it's not even protecting her deck leader, so we don't even know to worry about that card anymore. And... Uh, this card, this face down that we're about to move our Skullbird next to, is not a trap card. We don't have to worry about it being a trap card because if it was, she would have played it to the right originally and not top left from her deck leader. So now what we do is we just look for lethal, right? Now what you probably should do in this situation, again, I would check my hand here or you can move the Skullbird preemptively and then try to play something over it. If I had a warrior here or a beast, I would exit out of the hand, I'd move the Skullbird next to her and then I would fuse my warrior or my beast over that and attack her directly, but here I have a lesser dragon. Um, in this situation, it actually doesn't matter what I have in my hand as long as it will deal 1600 damage on mountain or more. So we just attack her with a lesser dragon. And that's how you play a late dimension hole. We draw a turn late and we still got a four turn kill, so yeah. Alright, let's finish things up with the terrain strat. Not that it is not important, it's actually a very important strat and you can be you're very likely to draw into this, but it's not actually that fast. Usually you will get a 5 turn kill on this strategy. So what we're doing here, I'm ignoring the dimension hole because I've already um, <laughs> demonstrated that. What we actually want to do is we want to open with something that's strong on our terrain card. So in this case, what we're going to do on our first turn is play a dragon zombie, and then we're going to play a terrain card on the second turn. If you don't have anything good on the first turn and all you have is stuff that's like strong on Wasteland or Yami, I would recommend playing whatever the highest attack possible card is that's strong on Wasteland or Yami, getting rid of everything else, and then hoping that you draw into a Yami on your second turn because you can still do this strategy. Here I open with it so I don't need to ditch it, but yeah. Now again, I get rid of the Dimension Hole, you shouldn't really get rid of this Dimension Hole, I'm doing this because I'm specifically not trying to demonstrate the Dimension Hole, I've already done that, I'm trying to demonstrate the Terrain card, so... Again, card in the middle, she'll either play to the right or top left, we've already been through that, it really doesn't matter in this situation. The thing about Terrain Strategy on this is that it's actually very safe, like it's really safe. It's not particularly fast, but it's very safe. So here we play Yami on that top right, and then we will flip it up and move it forward. And this positions Yami so that when we launch our uh, dragon zombie at her, anything, we, we just launch our, our monster, right? let's just say that, a monster that has bonus movement on this terrain. We launch it at her and then she will move naturally to the left, two spaces. She moves before she plays a card. So here it doesn't actually really matter what she plays. Uh, if she plays a trap it can change things a little bit, but uh, we, we're not going to be attacking into that spot anyway. This is just demonstrating the terrain card. So what we actually do now is we move here. Now what this does is that it forces her to move two spaces forward because she doesn't want to be threatened by this dragon zombie anymore. 
And the Dragon Zombie has bonus movement. So she doesn't want to move to the left, because it's still under threat of Dragon Zombie, and she won't want to move one space forward, because she could still get attacked by the Dragon Zombie. So by positioning this card here, she'll move two spaces forward. And then we can attack her. She'll be on the Yami as well, so we'll get bonus damage from our zombies. Here we just check the hand. We're looking for just as much damage as we can play. Um, you notice I do have a Skull Bird. I could make Punished Eagle, 2100. What we're kind of looking for is a zombie here, so we can actually do a lot of damage. So I get rid of any cards that are like kind of redundant that I'm not going to be using, like guaranteed not going to be using. And then move forward. You can also move to the right. I just move forward because I just think it's safer. I don't really know how true that is, but I don't actually think it matters too much, but I just move forward anyway. So yeah, she moves two spaces and then she can actually play behind her, funny enough. Otherwise, she'll just play out of the way. And she defends. Now, we know that that first, uh, the card to her left is not a trap card, otherwise she would have kept it at the bottom left, and then she would have, like, played around that. But because she keeps moving it, it is not a trap card, and we know the monster behind her is not a trap card, because she just, you know, telegraphed it as a monster by equipping it. Same as if she fuses. So what we do now is move to the right, and then we attack her. We have two options, actually. We can attack her from in front of her, in which case she'll move two spades to the left, and she will still be, uh, sorry, her right, and she'll still be on the Yami, so we can attack her again. Or if we attack her with something that has um, bonus movement to her, we, we attack in front of her, we play in front of our deck leader and attack her from her right side. She either moves two spaces forward, or she will move to the left and then up. And this depends a lot on what the position of her cards is currently. But, this is the safest thing we can do, right? So, here, what I can do, we don't need to play Yami, so I'm going to ditch them. We just want to play the highest attack possible here. So here I will play Punished Eagle. And we keep the dragon, because next turn, all we need to do is draw into a zombie. Uh, or, I guess, a rock that would do 2k. But we're just looking for max damage here, because you never know when you're going to be like 100 short or whatever. You just want to do max damage here, to make it as easy as possible for you to draw into lethal on the next turn. And now she will move as far away from this card as possible, because she has bonus movement. And she's still on the army. She is still on the army, so even something like a dragon zombie would be good enough. So we attack her directly with whatever it is. Um, now, funny enough, we don't have lethal here. That's pretty sad, isn't it? That's pretty sad. But, <laughs> if we had 1900 attack here, we would absolutely have lethal, so it's kind of sad. Um, that I wasn't able to demonstrate this 5 turn, but, again, you can see that if we drew into 1900 attack, we would kill her here. Uh, but we didn't, and, you know, um, you kind of get the point, right? This is a 5 turn, if we had the damage, if we had drawn into damage here. And you don't know what your draws are until you draw them, and the truth is, you're not always going to draw the perfect cards for every single situation, ever. So this is a realistic situation that you might find yourself in. In which case, I mean, you have a few options. I would move to the left, maybe, and then play top left and attack her, so she move back into the middle. But really, this should be a uh, lethal here. This really should be... Like, there's other plays I could do here. Like, if I had a zombie that wasn't lethal, if I had, like, literally four blank cards and just one zombie, I could move my dragon zombie down two spaces and then fuse a zombie over it to make skill gone and then attack her directly in lethal here, but I literally had nothing. The only thing I could do there is attack her with a lesser dragon um, for 1200 attack. Um, but yeah, if I literally had anything else in the hand that would help me there, if I had a zombie there... Um... And again, no, it's funny because, you know, dragon zombie doesn't actually fuse into a dragon with anything. Um, so, if that first card I played was not a dragon zombie, which that was the best option I had, if that was any other zombie that was weaker than 1600, then I could actually move that card down and fuse my dragon over and attack her with dragon zombie. Um, so really this should be a 5 turn, it's not, but it's just one of those things where no matter how prepared you are, no matter how much you are, like, making the best move possible all the time, it is still possible to get fucked over. Um, so I just thought I'd leave this in there, because, yeah. Especially in a duel like this, when there's a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of ways, and a lot of things that go wrong, you can just always just not draw into the good cards that you need to win, even if everything seems to be going very, very well, and you prepare yourself as much as possible. Don't give up on yourself, and yeah, keep at it.